Green Bay fans have high hopes that this will be an even better year than last, especially after the way the Packers shut out Joe Namath on opening night. Six days later, Detroit's Greg Landry on the game's first play from scrimmage again tested the Green Bay pass defense. And again, Ken Ellis was the hero as he came up with the first of three Packer interceptions. Green Bay's Scott Hunter did not have an easy day either. Most of the Packers' yardage was due to 22 typically rugged thrusts by John Brockington, whose 118 yards rushing totaled more than all the Lion runners combined. Rockington's running mate in the Green Bay Bull Elephant backfield is MacArthur Lane number 36, who burst for the flag in Green Bay's only touchdown. The Packers led until well into the fourth quarter, when Greg Landry was finally able to avoid an interception long enough to put the Lions in scoring position. Four and a half minutes left, Alty Taylor scored, and the Lions were ahead for the first time in the game, 13 to 10. But then a strange thing happened. With less than two minutes left, number 12, Jim Delgazo, entered his first game as a Green Bay Packer quarterback. Harry Smith was on the receiving end of Delgazo's first completion, but the Detroit defense was not about to be upstaged. Then came the game's key play. A minute and a half left, fourth down and 23 to go from his own 38. Everyone in Lambeau Field knew exactly what Jim Delgazo had to do. Clutch catch by Johnny Staggers gave Jim Delgazo all the time and operating room he really needed. One more completion to Barry Smith, plus a roughing penalty, set up Chester Marco for the all-important tying field goal. Marco's kick was good, but after the game, the name they were repeating in Green Bay was Delgazo, Delgazo. While the heroics of Jim Del Gazo's performance against the Lions two weeks ago had many Green Bay fans shouting his name, there was to be but one cry echoing across the gridiron of Metropolitan Stadium on this Sunday. Wishing to find out just who Del Watts's name was, the Purple Gang went in for a closer look. It wasn't long until the cry changed to what is a Del Gazo? The usually consistent Packer ground attack followed Del Gazo's example and fell before the purple people eaters. Scott Hunter replaced Del Gazo and appeared to have the pack on the move. However, an interception by Minnesota's Bob Bryant on the next play killed the drive. For the Viking offense, it was a day of frustration as big gainers did not lead to touchdowns. Ed Marinero's 27-yard sweep set up a second quarter field goal and brought Marinero's mafia to their feet. Fran Tarkenton split the seams of the Packers' secondary using his other running back, the versatile rookie from Miami, Chuck Foreman.
The leading Viking pass receiver in Russia rolled up well over 100 yards in total offense for the afternoon. For the second week in a row, the scoring punch was provided on three Fred Cox field goals. The defense added a safety for an 11-3 Minnesota win, proving a wise Viking saying. Eschewing the tables down at Morey's and the place where Louie dwells, Ivy League types brought their lunch to the Yale Bowl to watch the New York Giants battle the Green Bay Packers. In the Packers' first series, linebacker John Douglas stole this Jim Delgazo aerial, and after a lateral to Spider Lockhart, New York was in business at the Green Bay 36. Six plays later, Norm Sneed found Don Herman by the flag, and New York led seven to nothing. Later in the first period, after a giant fumble at their own 20, John Staggers legged in on this reverse and the score was tied at seven. For the remainder of the first half, both teams settled into a heavy-hitting defensive struggle. Beginning the third quarter, Scott Hunter replaced Jim Delgazo at the controls of the Green Bay attack. And hitting on conservative passes like this one to MacArthur Lane, the Packers moved in close for two field goals and a 13-7 advantage. Then Sneed, who hit on 21 of 28 throws for the afternoon, showing poise and a mastery of the short passing game, put together a careful drive, using his tight end Bob Tucker, number 38, to get the Giants in close to the Green Bay goal. And at the top of the fourth quarter, Sneed found Bob Grimm, who made a diving catch, giving the Giants a 14-13 advantage. Giants' frail one-point lead stood up until only one minute and 20 seconds remained when Scott Hunter found MacArthur Lane over the middle and Lane raced around the Giant defense into field goal range, the Giants' 29-yard line. With five seconds remaining, Chester Marco booted through a 32-yarder and the Green Bay Packers had a hard-fought 16-14 victory over the New York Giants leaving the Giants with a disappointing 1-2-1 one, one record, while Green Bay stayed within striking distance of the undefeated Minnesota Vikings in the NFC Central Division. In certain parts of Wisconsin, the citizens have their own ideas about how our country should be run. Scott Hunter's first scoring drive was thwarted by huge Wilbur Young, who batted Chester Marco's field goal attempt 30 yards upfield, where Nate Allen recovered for Kansas City. The Chiefs jumped on the break when Lynn Dawson sent the flow to his left and then threw right to the tallest target in the league, six foot 10 inch Morris Stroud, number 88. The Packers came back on the strong legs of John Brockington, who once again surpassed 100 yards rushing for the day. When Scott Hunter was shaken up, number 12 left-hander Jim Delgazo replaced him and set up a perfect corner pattern to wide receiver John Staggers, number 22. The half Green Bay led 10 to 7. In the second half, Jim Delgazo kept firing into the teeth of the Kansas City defense.
Del Gazo completed six of 12 attempts, but every time he seemed to have a promising drive going, disaster would strike. Five times the Chiefs defense stopped good scoring chances and the Packers defense made it tough for Lynn Dawson just to get out of his own end of the field. Young men with names from across the sea were called upon for the crucial three-point plays. Chester Markole and Jan Stenerud each connected once, and the two teams which last officially faced each other in Super Bowl number one ground out a safely played tie, 10-10. When you're hot, you're hot. And this year's edition of the Los Angeles Rams has something for all Southern Californians to cheer about. With a solid three-game lead in their division and the highest scoring offense in the NFL, the Rams are the most talked about show in town. After a scoreless first quarter, David Ray lobbed this three-pointer over from 44 yards out. Scott Hunter, hounded all afternoon by the relentless Los Angeles rush, lost more than his composure on this play. John Hadle, the NFL's top-rated passer, connected with Jack Snow for six, but the score was nullified by a holding penalty. It was much more costly to the pack, however, as all-pro candidate Willie Buchanan busted his leg on the play. The Rams' rapacious defense held the entire Packer offense to 63 yards. Just before the half, John Hadle and Harold Jackson teamed up once again. This time it was for keeps, and the sun-drenched crowd in the Coliseum was obviously having a ball. The Packers got a break at the start of the third quarter, and MacArthur Lane pitched a six-pointer to Barry Smith. With the score close at 10 to 7, the Rams started a push for a little breathing room. Jim Bertelson uncorked this 24-yard run to set up another David Ray field goal. Highlighting the Rams' final 80-yard scoring drive was this strike to veteran Jack Snow. With victory assured at 20 to 7, the Ram defense in the person of number 89 Fred Dreyer was just trying to do his job. First, it was Scott Hunter thrown for a 12-yard loss and sacked in the end zone. Minutes later, Jim Del Gazo fell victim to the same fate from the same fellow, Fred Dreyer. Out on the field, Fred was taking it all very nonchalantly. But the four points he singularly added to the final score came in a manner no other defensive man in the entire 53-year history of the NFL has matched. And by game's end, the unassuming Mr. Dreyer had apparently won himself a great deal more than just a game ball. Thus far this year, the Detroit Lions boosters have had little to cheer about. The last Sunday in rainy, cold Motor City, the timid Lions turned killer. From the start, it was obvious that the Lion defense was inspired as they brought the Packers bull elephant backfield to ground, allowing Green Bay only 60 yards rushing and three yards passing for the entire game. Packer quarterback Jim Del Gazel vainly attempted to elude marauding Lion Jim Laslovic, number 52.
When Scott Hunter entered the game, he fared no better as number 73. Bob Bell tracked him, twirled him, and tossed him down like a rag doll. In the air, the pack fared no better as Hunter's pass was picked off by number 23, Levi Johnson. Number 11, Greg Landry gave Detroit a 10-0 lead by bootlegging them in close enough for a two-yard Steve Owen touchdown and later a field goal. When quarterback Bill Munson came in, he used the Lions' other runners to tear up field. Number 42, Alty Taylor, rushed for 160 yards on 23 carries, a magician who turned the Green Bay defense into a sieve. Alty Taylor's nine-yard touchdown run put Detroit out of reach at 24 to nothing. Then Munson to number 81, John Hilton, finalized it at 34 to nothing. And a well-balanced team effort was more than appreciated by the man who must be the fastest sign maker in Motown. From the start, the Bears put the pack on its back. True, Green Bay generated some offense early in the game, most notably this 84-yard kickoff return by number 48, Ken Ellis. In all, the Packers squeezed 17 points out of the 98 yards in total offense they mustered. An impressive feat when you consider a minus 12 yards passy. MacArthur Lane and John Brockington were the primary reasons for the at least representative showing. The greater part of the afternoon was completely dominated by Chicago, however, as Ike Hill took the first punt and weaved it back 72 yards. But there couldn't have been a more dominant figure than Bobby Douglas. The much maligned signal caller threw 10 for 15, had 100 yards rushing and scored four touchdowns. He started things off with an easy connection to a tough running Craig Cotton. With freezing temperatures, Douglas kept ball handling to a minimum, especially when it counted.
While he's certainly not the best quarterback around, he's a mighty good athlete. And last Sunday, at least, that was good enough for 337 yards of offense. By the end of the afternoon, Douglas had personally run through, over, and around the Packers, sending them to their third straight defeat while lifting the Bears to their third victory in eight starts. Pre-game entertainment budgets have been cut to the bone in Green Bay. Or perhaps it was just their Thanksgiving came early presentation. And then the St. Louis Cardinals were presented with John Brockington, all 230 bruising pounds of him. Lately, teams have keyed on Brockington because they know that the Packer quarterbacks are not throwing well. But last week, John had himself so keyed up that he gouged out 137 yards rushing and gave the Pack the early lead. The hungry Packers blocked this St. Louis punt and their margin jumped to 10 to nothing. Then Donnie Anderson, number 44, celebrated his return to Green Bay with a catch and run that brought the Redbirds back part of the way at 10 to seven. Green Bay continued to build on its lead as number 25 Les Goodman filled in with power and crunch for the sideline MacArthur Lane. Quarterback Jerry Taggy in his first start added a touchdown to four Chester Marco field goals and Green Bay was in no mood to be headed. The Cardinals tried to blitz back as Jim Hart began honing in on wide receiver Ahmad Rashad. This 23-yard scoring play, combined with a Terry Metcalf two-yarder, closed the Cardinals to within four at 25-21. But victories have been all too few and precious for the Packers this year, and they weren't about to let this one go as their defense slammed the door and locked up win number three in nine games for Green Bay this year. With only five wins between them, you somehow felt that neither the Packers nor the Patriots could win this game. New England tried early to give it away, and their fumble eventually proved costly. With Jerry Taggy starting at quarterback, the Packers went with short passes to their running back, John Brockington, who turned them into sizable gains. Rockington then put the pack ahead on a scoring sweep that capped an 80-yard drive. Green Bay increased its lead to 14 zip when Perry Williams took it in from six yards out, and it looked like the Packers were in a cakewalk. The only thing that kept the Patriots close was the foot of Jeff White, who lucked one in and kicked three other field goals for the afternoon. Taggy to number 22, John Staggers got the Packers in close enough for a Chester Marcold field goal, and their cushion got fatter. Green Bay continued to dominate the game as number 48, Ken Ellis, slipped in, intercepted, and popped free for 47 yards and a 24-9 lead. But then the Patriots' defense shut down the end zone. 
Number 27, Ron Bolton, stopped this threat, and everyone wanted a hand in the congratulations. The play must have been inspirational because from that point on, the Patriots took Green Bay's best shots but came right back. Number 42, Mac Heron took one wallop but was there to haul in this Jim Plunkett pass and barge his way goldward. Then Jim Plunkett spotted his tight end, Bob Windsor, and Windsor zigged into the end zone with a block by Reggie Rucker, number 33, to bring the Patriots to within five at 24 to 19. Jim Plunkett continued his best day as a pro as he hit for 348 yards passing including this 63-yard score to Reggie Rucker. He also scored a one-yarder himself and turned his Patriots around to win 33-24. Although it was only win number three for Plunkett and the improving New Englanders, they were glad to avoid the short end of the score as well as the seller in the AFC East. In Milwaukee, the disappointing Packers were playing host to the sometimes hot Saints. But with Jerry Taggy starting at quarterback, the Pack wasn't going to disappoint anybody. Three times Taggy brought Green Bay to successful field goal range. Meanwhile, the Green Bay defense applied the squeeze to Archie Manning. The pressure finally paid a dividend when Al Matthews, number 29, intercepted and darted unimpeded 58 yards for six. A repeat of the play shows that the ball was deflected off the hands of Saint running back Joe Prophet, number 23, before Matthews snatched it out of the air and headed for a victory dance in the end zone. New Orleans' only touchdown of the afternoon came on an Archie Manning hookup with number 86, Jubilee Dunbar, who displayed his stop and spike technique. With the Saints closing at 13-10, Jerry Taggy took the option into his own hands and rambled 41 yards to put the Packers ahead 20-10. A repeat of the play shows that although Taggy is not Impala-like in his swiftness, he did manage to wind his way in for six with little in the way of opposition. But despite Jerry Taggy's offensive flare-up, the day belonged to the Packer defense, and they finished it fittingly on Jim Carter's interception and 42-yard return to make the final score Green Bay 30, New Orleans 10.
There were many who questioned the Vikings championship medal after last week's showing, and perhaps no one was more aware than the team itself. However, the Vikings are an exceptionally strong football team, exploding with power on the defense and offense. And against the Green Bay Packers, they weren't about to suffer another letdown. The only consistent attacking power for the Packers came from number 42, John Brockington. The Bull Elephant ripped for 124 yards on 27 grueling carries, placing him over the 1,000-yard mark for the third time in three seasons as a pro. Green Bay could score but once, as a 17-yarder from Jim Del Gazo to Barry Smith was all that the Big Purple defense would allow. The pack found consistent trouble in the person of number 20, cornerback Bobby Bryant. The six-year veteran who once turned down a professional baseball contract to roam the gridiron for the Vikings Picked off three Jerry Taggy aerials, returning one 46 yards for a touchdown. Offensively for the Vikes, Fran Tarkenton waved his magical arm to produce two TD strikes, the first going to tight end Stu Voigt. Tarkenton came back with a 20-yard floater to super catcher John Gilliam. Minnesota received a big day from number 44, Chuck Foreman, as the Rookie of the Year candidate posted 100 yards for the afternoon. This one going for 50 yards and a score. With a 31-7 victory over Green Bay, the Vikings will be looking for win number 12 of the season this week against the New York Giants. Both clubs have had their ups and downs this season, but this time it was the Pack who was up to putting the Bears down. Number 76, Mike McCoy led the Packer assault with nine unassisted tackles as Green Bay shut out the Bears. Week before last, number 42, John Brockington, became the first player in NFL history to record 1,000-yard seasons in his first three years in the league. And last week against Chicago, a former Ohio State star exploded for 142 yards on 22 carries, this one going 53 and setting up a short Packer touchdown. Green Bay quarterback Jerry Taggy connected on only three passes all afternoon. However, two of them went for scores to number 22, John Staggers. Second Taggy to Staggers hookup covered 36 yards while giving the Packers their fifth win of the season in a 21-0 win over the NFC Central Cellar Dwellers, the Chicago Bears.